Hello, uh, welcome to the Global Security Forum, to a session um, on hard choices with Lord Peter Ricketts. Um, I'm Michael Clark. I'm one of the uh, Advisory Council members of the Global Security Forum, and I'm here because our normal chairman, Lord Lothian, of course, um, uh, is stuck in Scotland, can't be here today, so I'm uh, standing in for him. Um, I should say this is our last session of the 2020-2021 year. Um, we've had some excellent uh, sessions this year uh, using the new technologies, doing the best we can in lockdown. And I have to pay tribute to Jacqueline Jinks and the team for having put these sessions on. Um, they've been superb and they've worked technically and intellectually. And I think the Global Security Forum members will all know what I mean when I say that we owe Jacqueline um, a great debt of thanks for all of this. Um, in the autumn, uh, we'll go back to in-person, really live uh, events, but also, on the basis of the success of some of these things, we may do some hybrid events so that they'll be in-person, but also online, uh, and also broadcast. So uh, you'll see the GSF in a, in, in a new guise um, next year. At the moment, um, you're on view only for this session, but of course we encourage you to ask questions and, uh, in the Q&A function. Uh, of your systems. Um, when you do that, we'd like you please to type your questions in, but we'll also try to take your questions live so that you can put them uh, in voice uh, when it uh, comes to it. But if something goes wrong, technically, at least we've got your question on screen and we will ensure that it is asked. If you don't want to ask your question in person, in voice, then just put read on it and, and Jacqueline and the team in the gallery will know that and will uh, let us know. Uh, we are recording this from now, and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. Uh, the uh, coordinates for that will be on the GSF website uh, later on today. And if you view things on Twitter, then you'll be able to see it on Twitter at uh, hashtag GSF Events Day, all one word, hashtag GSF Events Day, uh, and you can see it there. So, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Peter Ricketts, Lord Peter Ricketts. To everyone, I think, on this call, he'll be very familiar to pretty well everybody. We've, we've known him as a colleague and friend for a very long time. If you look down his formal CV, the thing that strikes you most is that in, in a 40-year career in diplomacy, he was there. He was there at so many important points. So he was the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee. He was our perm rep, our permanent representative to NATO. He was the permanent undersecretary uh, at the Foreign Office. Um, he was the first national security advisor. He set up the National Security Council in 2010, and he tweaked it in ways that he felt would, would give the whole machinery a more strategic focus. He is the, he's the man who understands what uh, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, was trying to do in creating a National Security Council. He was then ambassador to France. Um, he went into the House of Lords in 2016, and he's these days um, connected with uh, work for Lockheed Martin, and also, I'm very proud to say, also for King's College London. And if you look at his book, and I hope a lot of you have already bought it, and I bought a copy some time ago, it's called Hard Choices. I'd say this book, Hard Choices, is very hard-hitting. Um, it has got some very important um, and hard-hitting things to say, and it it's a thematically very interesting book. It, he, uh, Peter Ricketts takes us through wh why we got to where we are now and how we need to think strategically and then what sort of hard choices we've got to make in order to think, to think strategically. He has things to say about um, Alex Cadogan, uh, who did so much actually to, to create the Atlantic Alliance. He's got characters in there that some of us met, like, like uh, Jock Dean who was in charge of the Mutual and Balanced Force Reduction Talk, set up a singing arrangement every week in the back room of a, of a hotel where the delegates all sang to each other every week throughout the, the talks, probably did more for diplomacy than ever went on at the negotiating table. And he talks about Norman Brook and the future policy study in 1960, a, a, a genuinely strategic study which Macmillan, the Prime Minister, took seriously and made into something. And by looking at the past in the way that he does, Peter deals with issues that lots of us feel familiar with, but he's always got something to say about them. He's always got something different to say, and he's got very often very personal vignettes to offer and some very interesting indiscretions. So it seems to me that this is a great book to read. It's a great read, 
but it is also more interesting and important, in my view, than anything you'll read in Dominic Cummings' blog. And I, rec I recommend it to you um, for that reason alone. And so I'm, I'm happy to hand over to Peter for 10 or 15 minutes for him to tell us whatever he wants to, to tell us about the book. And then we'll have a little bit of conversation and Q&A. And then we'll try and tease him into um, saying anything else indiscreet that he'd like to offer. So, Peter, over to you, <coughs> sir. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Well, that's a very generous introduction. and You've done a better job than I could of uh, <laughs> saying what this book is about. Um, and it's wonderful to have so many friends and colleagues on this call, even if we can't actually meet personally yet. Um, so, yes, I mean, why write another book? Well, uh, I did feel that uh, I had had the privilege uh, through my career of 40 years of being very much at the heart of this international system. We hear so much now about it being under stress and strain. And I did think that there were some lessons from that experience, which it was worth trying to um, distill before I forgot them. Um, and also because I find that for the younger generation now coming into um, diplomacy, uh, commentating, academic life, um, some of what I lived through feels to them like ancient history. And therefore it was worth capturing it and then applying it <clears throat> to the, what I think are the big choices the country still faces. Um, and indeed, these choices are not I think, yet clear, even after the government's integrated review. So, um, as Michael said, I tried to ground it in some history. And I start with one of my favorite documents, which is the Atlantic Charter. Favorite because, uh, even as a young diplomat, uh, I saw it hanging on the wall of the permanent undersecretary's office in the Foreign Office, the last draft of it with Churchill's um, manuscript amendments on it. Um, and when I came to study it and, and think about it, it was actually the foundational document of this international order. Much of it drafted by the then PUS in the Foreign Office, Alec Cadogan, on a warship alongside Churchill at the first Churchill Roosevelt summit, the only Foreign Office official there, 2,000 miles from home base, no communications with them really. He wrote out a series of principles, which after a couple of days of negotiation emerged as this Atlantic Charter. And I was interested to see that it, it had um, the respect of imitation in the sense that the government um, and, and put out a new Atlantic Charter uh, when Joe Biden came to call last month, which I think the original was better and, and, and more groundbreaking, uh, and, uh, paved the way for more interesting developments. However, we can come back to that. Um, that Atlantic Charter uh, was the foundation of the UN, uh, and you can trace, in a way, NATO back to it as well. Um, and one of the first part of the book, I wanted to look at why those organizations have proved so durable. Um, they have faults, of course, um, but also what their strengths were and why they have provided 70 years of at least a degree of stability. Um, I talk about why NATO, what the secret is of NATO's continuing vitality. Um, I look briefly at that episode where Monet and Schumann tried to apply the European economic integration principles to defense and failed completely when the European defense community was vetoed by the French National Assembly of, of anyone uh, in 1954. Then I look a bit on the basis of my own experience really at the um, Cold War, how the international system, particularly NATO functioned, uh, how we moved from the Americans as the indispensable ally through that period to a very contested ally uh, in the case of the Iraq war, which I uh, lived in London at pretty close quarters, uh, and then to an ally who was really losing appetite to be the leader of the international system that they were so instrumental in setting up. Uh, and I relived a bit the experience of the Libya conflict when I was national security advisor, sitting alongside David Cameron in that period where Barack Obama chose to lead from behind on uh, a major European security crisis. Then in the second part, and again, uh, Michael, you mentioned this, um, I look at the strengths and weaknesses we have as we face up to um, a, a disruption in our national strategy, as great as Alec Cadogan and his generation faced in the late 1940s with Brexit, um, with the shift of the international system, uh, now with the pandemic, which really broke over us as I was writing this book. <clears throat> and I talk quite a bit about why I think we are so poor as a country um, among Western democracies in thinking strategically, thinking longer term. Uh, I think the art of strategy making, which was so obvious um, at the time of Macmillan um, commissioning this future policy study in 1960, has somewhere along the line been lost, partly because we've been in a period of such 
strategic stability, partly because all the pressures of modern politics, um, right up to social media, um, pull politicians for quite understandable reasons into crisis management and firefighting. Um, and many of them I found were rather scornful of the value of trying to step back and think uh, a little way down the road since that would be inevitably after the next election, and perhaps um, you know, after they left office. So I think we do need to find a way of making more space in our, in our public policy for thinking longer term. Uh, I think we have to be careful as a country that we husband our capacity to influence in the world, uh, because I think we've rather squandered that with some of the way that the Brexit uh, issue has been conducted. And I also think we need to remember the importance of choosing. In the end, strategy is about choosing. And my book, I call Hard Choices, partly because I think we, this, our governments recently have been very poor at choosing, for example, national security priorities. We tried to do a prioritized list in 2010. It grew in 2015. And when you come to look at the integrated review, it has a lot of very ambitious ideas, but no sense of priority at all. No sense that resources are finite. Uh, and that in the end, we need to concentrate our resources and our capacities to influence on the things that will really matter. And then I finish up uh, by trying to apply what I have distilled there in, in four big issues, which I think the country faces, and I think still faces um, now, as I say, after the integrated review. Um, the first one is um, basically to come to terms with uh, the real weight and role that Britain can play in the world. I sensed in the integrated review a lot of serious and interesting policy substance written, no doubt, by the team uh, that, that uh, put that together. But one felt also poking through all the time a sort of uh, hubristic um, Britannia rules the waves exceptionalism, um, which I think was there in the Brexit debate as well. It's there in the constant claims that Britain will be a soft power superpower, a science and technology superpower, the leading role in NATO, um, the regulatory diplomacy experts, climate change leaders, and so on. Um, I think Britain, after Brexit, uh, needs to take the opportunity to find a new national story, which recognises we're still a very strong, influential player, but best of all, when we're working with allies and partners, making that international system work, um, and dial down a bit <clears throat> the exceptionalist rhetoric. Um, more briefly, um, I think the second area is that as a country now outside the EU, we're going to have to have a whole series of awkward, difficult choices to make between uh, more powerful uh, economic partners and blocs. That's very clear in the area of trade deals. We've already seen it with Australia, where uh, striking an Australia trade deal means some very difficult trade-offs, particularly over um, um, food, meat in particular. It will be even worse uh, with the US. Uh, we will have to make some choices as well in the area of norms and standards, which um, rather than being a regulatory diplomacy leader, we will find that either the EU or the US um, or potentially China are doing the standard setting and we will be trying to influence it at the margins. I think we will also find it's quite difficult to maintain the policy of speaking up for human rights as we have bravely been doing over uh, Hong Kong and China's treatment of the Uyghurs. Uh, when we also need a functioning, productive commercial relationship with China. And that's my third area, which I think choices still have to be made. The integrated review was a masterly piece of strategic ambiguity about China, uh, recognizing the importance of strategic competition where we have to, but also trying to reserve space to work with China on the big global issues like climate change and, and also a commercial partner. How long can we sustain that sort of strategic ambiguity, especially if American policy toughens towards China in the years ahead, as I think is very likely? Uh, and then the fourth of my choices is really about uh, what are we going to do with our relationship with Europe and particularly the European Union? Uh, the government are um, betting that they can have good, effective relations with individual countries in Europe, like France and Germany, or groups of countries like the Nordics and Baltics, while having a very uh, adversarial, difficult, distant relationship with the EU as a whole, and no structured relationship with the EU on foreign policy and defence. I don't think that that can work. Uh, I think we do have to make a choice in the years ahead to get back to having a proper 
uh, mature relationship with the EU as well as individual countries. That is Britain's natural position uh, in a uh, world that is increasingly divided between larger economic blocs. I think it's very difficult at the moment, given the uh, divisions and polarization in our politics and the baggage which this government are now carrying on the whole issue of relations with the EU. But we saw, for example, at the uh, uh, Carvey Space Summit, that what should have been a showcase for global Britain um, descended into an argument between the Prime Minister and Emmanuel Macron about sausages in Northern Ireland. Mm. A scratchy relationship with the EU will colour Britain's efforts to redefine itself in the world till we can sort that out. So there are four broad choices. I'm sure there are many others as well. My last point, Michael, is that I do think as we talk about a new national story, a strategy for the UK, it needs to involve a wider group of people, probably than those on this call, that, that, um, uh, the circles that we move in. We need to engage younger people. We need to engage civil society more widely in the country. These are decisions that will shape the way Britain is for uh, you know, a generation to come. Uh, our attitudes towards immigration, towards the outside world, towards Europe. They need to be taken in a broader context. I hope the Integrated Review is a start. I hope my book, in a very modest way, helps to open up these issues a bit, uh, because I think we need new voices coming into the debate. Mm. So there's an, there's an opener from me. Michael, back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. I, I'd, I'd like to come back to this new national story in a moment, but could, could I just raise a couple of other questions first? That You speak quite a lot in the book about cyber, uh, the cyber uh, world in which we live and the digitization of societies, the vulnerabilities and the opportunities that that creates. So as a, uh, a, a diplomat of 40 years experience and standing, do you see that, as it were, the cyber world as changing the nature of diplomacy in some significant way? Um, do you, you know, what, what, what would you say are the impacts of that? Because you've got lots of things to say about the difficulties of the Huawei decision and the problem of understanding where the different internets are going, given that the autocratic internet seems to be uh, increasing in, in, uh, in value to those who run it. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if I could just draw you out on some of those aspects of the cyber world and, and diplomacy from our point of view. Yeah, can I distinguish a little bit between the digital world and the 24-7 online connectivity world yeah. and cyber, because they're slightly different things. I think the, the uh, omnipresence of the digital world changes diplomacy completely, yes, uh, because it enables a diplomat, an embassy, um, to connect potentially with everyone in the country uh, where they're serving. It allows diplomats to hoover up um, public opinion, to sample and the trends in, in thinking in a country in a way that we were never able to. Mm. I mean, we were able to read the newspapers, but we were not able to send out tweets and, and uh, Facebook um, posts and so on uh, that could potentially be um, uh, consumed by everyone and also to engage in discussion uh, mm. across uh, countries. So I think the digital uh, revolution also revolutionizes diplomacy, yes. And if it was ever about uh, quiet conversations between foreign ministries. It certainly isn't now. It spreads into every area of life and it potentially gives every citizen a, a yeah. voice in, in diplomacy. How we actually then manage that and, and consolidate that is a different thing. I think the issue of, of, of cyber as well is um, also transformational. Uh, I think we are seeing increasingly that um, it is allowing international criminal gangs uh, much easier access to all our countries, uh, our institutions, our companies, uh, private citizens and all the dangers that, that brings. The digital world has enormous opportunities, of course, but also huge risks. Uh, and I think we're only just at the beginning of working through how that might work, you know, what kind of rules of the road might we possibly mm. be able to negotiate internationally. In some ways, it feels like the early 1950s and nuclear weapons. There are these incredibly powerful instruments in the hands of countries, not just countries, in case of cyber attacks, um, but no guidance at all on how we uh, avoid you know, mutually assured destruction. So, uh, yeah, the, the cyber threat is real, absolutely, and uh, part of diplomacy now. But the impact of um, the digital world and communications on how diplomats do their business, very profound. Mm. And just one other, one other thing before I want to take up this, this national new national story. The, the, the role of the Foreign Office um, over the last 10 or 15 years, to those of us on the outside who've been observing and writing and so on, 
one feels it, it wasn't just Brexit that, as it were, pushed the Foreign Office onto the margins in some ways of, of central external policy making that it's it seemed to be moving there already i just wonder if you if you would would reflect as somebody who was permanent undersecretary at the foreign office and then national security advisor at the center of the machine i mean what has what has happened to the foreign office and can it can it as it were move back nearer to a, a position where it can help to strategize our external policy a bit more efficiently than it has been able to in the last decade or more? It hasn't helped, I think, that the um, perimeter of the Foreign Office has kept changing. Yeah. Um, the fact that Europe was basically removed from the Foreign Office perimeter and put into DEXU for the yeah. period of the EU negotiations was, in a way, a strange decision, since it was at the heart of Britain's foreign policy. Um, international trade now separated off into a, a different department. Um, on the other hand, uh, DFID wrapped back into the Foreign Office again. So constantly shifting perimeter doesn't help. The FCDO, as it now is, ought to be the strategic centre of the government for thinking about international affairs broadly. There's no other part of government where it could be done, and the National Security Secretariat is too small, I think, to do that kind of thinking. Uh, and it ought to be using the National Security Council structure as an amplifier and a multiplier for the ideas and the concepts coming out of the Foreign Office. I think the part of the idea of wrapping DFID back into the Foreign Office was to make the Foreign Secretary the single kind of point of strategic thinking in government on abroad. Um, I'm not sure whether it's quite got back to that yet. I think the um, current um, generation of officials are well capable of thinking strategically. The trick is to make ministers interested in their product, get it listened to. Uh, and the last thing I would say is that, of course, embassies and high commissions are still Britain's single point of focus on foreign countries. Um, no one in the British government had a better view of what was going on in France mm. than all of us in the British Embassy in France. Mm. And that was really part of our role to integrate all the different aspects of British policy towards country A, B or C uh, in order to focus them back into London. That is still very much the role. At the centre, uh, it's become more confused because of these changing boundaries. But perhaps we are destined to go back now to a foreign office and FCDO, which is the recognised centre in government for thinking conceptually about foreign affairs. We certainly need that. Mm. And then just one final thought from me before I th throw it open. The, just the, the new national story that you talk about, I think a lot of people would agree with that, that we need a new national story and not a story of exceptionalism and difficult relations with our nearest uh, neighbours and so on. If, if, I mean, as we're throwing forward to 2030 or 2035, say, if we, if we were successful in the ways we you would like us to be successful, what, what might you be looking back on, say, in 10 or 15 years' time as, the, as a successful national story? You know, what, what would you like us to have become in 15 years as, a, as opposed to what we are now in the way that we uh, approach the world? What are the elements of that national story that, if all went well, we could, we could look back with some pride and say, yeah, well, we changed the narrative between 2021 and Peter's book, um, and mm -hmm. 2035, where we are now, the narrative changed. So what might those changes be in an ideal world? Well, I won't make too many claims for my book as part of that process, but uh, I mean, I think part of it is to put behind us, finally, the uh, 1940 as you know, the only point of reference about how, when Britain was great in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, it has served us very well. It's right to be proud of our, of our heritage and our history. But unlike many, many other countries um, who have faced up to their past, I think Britain is only now just beginning to face up to both its past, and its colonial history, um, and the reality of the present. Uh, and I would like to feel that in 15 years' time, the country will be comfortable in its own skin, comfortable with being not um, you know, a great power circa 1944, but a, a strong, influential, middle-sized country uh, with strong international partnerships, at ease with our relationship with our European neighbours, as well as more widely, um, not uh, in the current kind of stressed state about uh, sovereignty and how to protect sovereignty, but re rediscovering the fact that we are, by instinct and by reputation and by history, an international player at our best when we're working with others, convening and squeezing out consensus where it didn't seem to be existing before, at the heart of the international order as it will then be, which, of course, will have moved on. 
Uh, the EU will have moved on, Britain will have moved on. I hope by then we can have a much more mature relationship uh, across the Channel. Yes, we might all look back in 2035 if we're still here and say, what was all that about? <laughs> what, what, what was that hole in Broccoli about, given where we all are now? Yeah. Anyway, well, let's, okay. hope so. let's hope so. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me stop monopolising the conversation. Now, I'd, I would like to continue, um, but throw it open now more generally to the membership. And so we have a first question, I think, from Lord Howell of Guildford. Um, is he able to put his yeah, question? Can you, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? Lord yes. Howell. We can, David, yes. Well, I, well, I just want to say it's an excellent read, this book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I particularly agree about the dangers of overselling the leadership idea in a network world where it doesn't work like that anymore. I think the United States suffers from this even more than we do. And quite right to, uh, to, to dial that down. But I, I must confess, I'm a bit puzzled about um bit of the general approach in your book to new networks and the national story thing which we've just been discussing with michael um uh, when you think that the commonwealth network which is much the biggest in the world is um as we're told it's now moved to the center of uk trade plans as apparently it has and it's obviously the biggest engine of soft power and soft power is really increasingly with smart power, the name of the game in international influence and affairs in the digital age. And when our diplomacy, as you rightly say, has changed its nature fundamentally, why are you a bit dismissive of the Commonwealth? It's not just you, of course, it's a, the, the media and quite a lot of foreign policy experts. They don't seem to understand that this is where the power and the networking is taking place, often outside the reach of government. Well, David, thank you very much. And, and I know what a staunch and, and persuasive advocate you are for the Commonwealth. And of course, uh, it's an important bond between Britain uh, and all these other uh, members. It's a bond, as you say, often beyond governments. There are networks um, uh, in civil society, uh, in the law, in education, in culture, in sport, in many areas that link us very closely together with other Commonwealth countries, absolutely. But I think in the area of public policy, um, it's a relatively limited network. I mean, you mentioned trade. I mean, we've just had the example of the UK-Australia trade agreement, uh, which seems to have been pretty hard fought, actually, um, and with the UK having to make some quite difficult concessions in order to get the agreement, so difficult that some of them uh, will take 15 years before they are fully implemented. And the net effect uh, on our GDP is of the order of 0.02%, 0, 0 uh, if I remember rightly. It, so the trade relationship with Commonwealth countries, given the distance involved, is never going to be as significant as countries much closer to home. And they will be as tough with the UK as with any other country when they come to negotiate trade deals, because they will be putting their national interests first, quite rightly. Um, and rather the same is true in other policy areas as well. I think the Commonwealth can be a really interesting network, for example, to talk about climate change, but I don't see it as a policy-making community because the interests are so different and countries will in the end put their own national and regional interests first. So while not underselling the Commonwealth, I wouldn't oversell it as um, an opportunity for Britain to influence policy-making in the wider world. I think that's the distinction that I'd make. But I absolutely agree with you that um, Many other countries would be delighted to have the sort of network that the Commonwealth provides, particularly outside government life. Hmm. Peter, thank you. Um, you mention in the book, you've got some very interesting things to say about Afghanistan and the operations in Afghanistan. And we have a question now about Afghanistan from Robert Brinkley. Robert, are you able to put your question directly? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Robert. Yes, absolutely. P Peter, very good to see you. Um, the United States and its allies are leaving Afghanistan after 20 years. Mm. A great deal of blood and treasure has been spent. What lasting benefits have been gained? Hard to enumerate them, I think, at this stage, Robert. Um, uh, of course, the high hopes of 2001 and two that we, we would be able to install a Karzai government that would... Um, if not bring Western democracy to Afghanistan, at least a degree of stability uh, and improvement in conditions of life in Afghanistan you know, has not been met. Uh, some of the uh, indicators, of course, are much better uh, in terms of girls' education and health, but uh, the prospect is not good. 
Uh, and I personally think it's a pity that Western countries were not able to agree to keep enough security forces there to at least keep running the military training programs that the UK and others have been very much engaged with since we uh, left the combat mission. Uh, those will clearly now go as well. And maybe our entire Western presence in Afghanistan will go if the um, uh, Taliban uh, threat continues to grow. So, I mean, looking back, it's hard really to see that those 20 years of intense and extremely well-meant Western effort are going to leave much of a lasting trace on Afghanistan. It would be nice to think that um, the educational opportunities that we did provide might have sown seeds in the younger generation who in years to come will move into power positions and take a more um, enlightened view perhaps of some of the issues than the current uh, Taliban leaders seem to do. But uh, it's a fairly dispiriting moment, to be absolutely honest, after the 20 years of effort that Western countries put in all the lives that were lost. You've got, uh, I mean, in the book you talk quite a lot about um, the decisions to go in, to, for Blair to get involved in Iraq in 2002. And you were at the UN, um, then working with Jack Straw. I mean, there's very interesting accounts of the Security Council meetings uh, when Jack Straw had to stand up and see if he could get a round of applause for what he was, <laughs> what he was saying. Um, mm. But do you think, did Blair have any choice but to stick with the United States in, in, in that, on that occasion. After all that had gone since the, the, uh, the Gulf War of, of 1991, after the no-fly zones, after all that, that Britain had stood with the United States, he couldn't not have supported the US in 2003, could he? 2002, 2003? Well, the what-ifs of history are always interesting, aren't they? In my judgment, he did have a choice, actually. Okay. Um, and it now appears from the Chilcot report that he committed us uh, in the summer of 2002 or April of 2002 uh, that, uh, you know, I will be with you come what may um, in, in his famous uh, bilateral uh, with uh, Bush at that time. Mm-hmm. So from that time onwards, it seemed that we were committed to whatever policy course the Americans chose um, without actually any of us, apart from a small circle, I suppose, knowing that the prime minister had done that. Um, I think we could have um, continued to demand that the Americans pursued a UN authorized route. Um, it would have been difficult, but right up till quite late in the day, we did have that option. Uh, and I think if the Brits had pulled out, maybe Bush would have gone on ahead. But um, there is still quite a power in the US of having some allies with you before you launch into something like uh, the Iraq attack. And I think if Britain had um, been clearer in the autumn of 2002 that we would not go to war without a further authorizing resolution, uh, it might have given Bush pause. I mean, we will never know. Um, I say in the book that um, I think that Blair was operating on uh, conviction. I mean, he was an intense conviction politician at that point. He was deeply, deeply influenced by 9-11 and a feeling that that must never be allowed to happen again and that the risk calculus had changed, so that where we had uh, contained Saddam Hussein's um, weapons of mass destruction program for many years, um, after 9-11, Blair's judgment was that the calculus had changed and that that was no longer tolerable, uh, and that we would uh, follow the Americans in dealing with it by military intervention. Uh, you observed sure that, that he that was a was different so. man between, before and after 9-11. You, you, he I was. Think you say he was, he was a different animal. He was a driven man. Yeah. Was, I really was. I mean, I saw him at very close quarters. And I don't, you know, he, it was absolute conviction. Uh, he wasn't putting it on. He really, mm. really believed that. Mm. Not many in his cabinet really did as well. I mean, I don't think Jack Straw was as passionate and certainly people like Claire Shaw were, were not. Yeah. So uh, it was an example to me of how a prime minister with a powerful conviction and a big parliamentary majority can drive British policy. Yeah. Uh, there yeah. are other examples as well, but I think that's a very good one. Mm. And it was very much a personal Blair sense of mission at that point. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, We move now to soft power. Craig Oliphant um, from the Foreign Policy Centre has put a question in that he that I will read. He's not putting it personally. So he says, thank you for your presentation, Peter. Great book, he says. Obviously, he's bought it. Um, Thank you. (laughs) In terms of global Britain, in inverted commas, and the importance of soft power, he he said he would welcome your comments on the cuts that have been made on uh, overseas development aid 
the British Council and indeed how you consider the current state of funding on BBC World Service. So I wonder if you'd like just like to reflect on the degree to which the government is backing its soft power, superpower instincts. We are a super, soft power, superpower, it says. Are we yeah. backing that up? That's what it says. Um, and uh, Craig enumerates some of the most important aspects of being a soft power, superpower. Uh, our global reputation as a development uh, pioneer, um, the British Council, uh, the BBC World Service, there are of course others, our wonderful universities, uh, our cultural sector, our music sector, mm. dare I say our football. Um, there are a lot of very attractive aspects of Britain that um, connect with people all around the world. Um, what do I think about the cuts in the, in the uh, aid budget? I've been very critical of that publicly, partly because, as I said, Britain uh, had a real reputation of being a leading thinker as well as uh, a generous donor in this area. And although I'm a foreign office man to my core, I um, would have preferred to see DFID remain a separate uh, ministry with a separate cabinet minister, because I think that was part of showing that development uh, policy um, had a different logic from simply being one adjunct of foreign policy more widely. What was damaging, I think, was um, the suddenness of the cut, uh, which meant that from one financial year to the next, almost from one month to the next, a whole series of programs around the world, around the world simply had to be shut down because a great deal of um, development money is already ring-fenced for multi-year contracts with uh, multilateral uh, aid providers, um, World Bank and many others. It meant that the burden of the cuts fell disproportionately on the bilateral aid programs, humanitarian aid programs in many of the poorest countries, and they literally saw things shutting down from one month to the next. And although after the cuts, Britain is still a major donor, I think the loss of reputation uh, for the consistency and the predictability that we'd had for many years you know, has been very sharp. Uh, and I think that that has really damaged the UK's soft power uh, position, not least because all other G7 countries at the moment are increasing their development spending uh, at a time when the pandemic is, is worsening inequalities around the world. So I think that that was a short-sighted and badly judged decision, given the scale of money that had been put into the pandemic. The four billion pounds involved uh, really, I don't think, would made a difference to the you know, overall ba macro balance of the public finances. The fact that we also increased our defence spending by four billion pounds a year at the same time suggested a sharp shift by the UK away from soft power towards hard power, um, which is you know. Uh, there are benefits, of course, to the defence community in that. Hard to square with the rhetoric of the integrated review. Um, British Council has been underfunded for many, many years. And I think if other countries had as powerful an instrument for soft power as that, they would fund it more generously. Um, BBC World Service has had some increases, I think. I mean, I'm not absolutely up to speed. But those are two powerful tools of British soft power and ought to be funded accordingly. Mm, indeed. Thank you. Um, move now to China. Tony Brenton, uh, who you will know, a uh, very distinguished ex-ambassador to Russia. Oh, um, and Tony asks, oh, sorry, T Tony, you can put your question. I beg your pardon. Yes, thank you. Uh, am I audible? You are, you are yes. Tony. Okay, yep. very good. Um, first of all, Peter, congratulations on the book, which I have bought, although I have yet to read. But you did mention what I think is going to be a very central foreign policy choice for us, which is with what is visibly a, an upcoming serious co confrontation between the United States and China, we have a difficult choice to make as to whether our commercial interests in China are more important than what we habitually do, which is aligning ourselves with the United States will almost come what may. Which way do you think we should jump? Thank you, Tony. Well, you're right. Um, except even with the Americans, it's far from being that black and white, isn't it, at the moment? I think Apple you know, sell a large proportion of their global output of iPhones in China. Um, for General Motors, I think China is their largest export market. So the interconnectedness of the Western economy, US economy, and China is far, far greater than uh, it ever was with the Soviet Union. And you know Russia much better than I do. So I think talking about a new Cold War neglects that interconnectedness, which is where the economies start from. The interdependence will shift over time. Yes, because uh, Western countries, starting with America, are going to give higher higher um, uh, priority to security concerns. I spent a bit of time in the book talking about the Huawei case, um, which I thought was quite an interesting demonstration. 
it's a demonstration of how the raw power of the US when applied to a country like Britain can turn um, the political debate around. Uh, the US were at one point prepared to threaten the intelligence relationship, whether they would have carried that out, I don't know. Um, and therefore the Johnson government had no alternative but to come to heel. But the really interesting thing seems to me in the, in the Huawei 5G episode that the Americans didn't have their own solution. I mean, they were hell bent on ensuring that Britain and other countries didn't take Huawei kit. Um, but all they could do was recommend Nokia or Ericsson in its place because they didn't have an alternative. So that's a strategic failure in America to have thought ahead about their security dependency on China. And I suspect the same is true in many other areas. Um, now, UK will never, I think, stand out against um, you know force majeure, political force majeure from the Americans if they choose to apply it, but there will be a cost when they do. But I don't think that the UK interest is quite the same as the Americans. I mean, our economy is so much smaller. Um, after Brexit, we've taken a major economic hit, which at the moment is masked by the pandemic, but will become clearer. And we need the Chinese market and others. We need Chinese investment in the UK. And therefore, we're going to have to, I think, continue to walk this very awkward tightrope between uh, security competitiveness, vigilance, and commercial opportunism. Um, I call it in the book, the, the mercantilist dilemma. I, mean, I think we would love, I'm sure, to stand up for uh, the rights in Hong Kong and the Uyghurs and so on um, through to the bitter end. On the other hand, when major commercial contracts come into play as well, we have to remember our mercantilist need to find new sources of uh, trade and growth after Brexit. So, I mean, I think, conclusion, it's going to continue to be a very awkward tightrope walk, I think, on China, very much like it is with other European countries. And perhaps a place to start is to make common cause for once with European countries on China policy. Indeed. OK, thank you. Um, now, an another live question from Sir David Madden, who's got a rather cheeky question to ask. Sir David. David, you can't ask me a cheeky question. <laughs> <laughs> I could. Peter, it's good to be in touch, well, virtually, and to hear some real common sense on foreign and security policy. You that, correctly that sounds define... a, worry, a worrying build-up, David. <laughs> <laughs> you correctly define the role of an embassy in pulling together all available knowledge of country X and transmitting to London. But who in London is listening? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that is a very good question. I mean, the answer, of course, is that the um, officials in the Foreign Office are listening. Um, uh, I'm sure they are reflecting to their ministers the advice that they're getting from embassies and high commissions around the world. I'm confident that advice will be honest, um, dispassionate, neutral advice, as the civil service does, and that that will be fed to ministers. Whether ministers are listening, I don't know. Uh, I have my doubts particularly anything that comes from European embassies. I mean, we do seem to have a very curious political context at the moment where we talk about global Britain, we talk about um, an expansive role for Britain in the world, but we have almost nothing to say about a relationship with the EU in foreign policy or uh, defence or security, all these areas. And so uh, I don't know to what extent ministers are prepared to listen to advice from their ambassadors, particularly in Europe, I hope that they are doing so, but I have my doubts. Hmm. OK, a um, question from uh, Mike Maiden, um, ex-BAE, good friend of uh, Global Security Forum, uh, which I will read. Uh, and he says, do you think that before France and the UK can re-establish a positive bilateral relationship, it will be necessary for both prime ministers to have left office? Can we do it in this generation of leaders, in a, in a, is the question, really. Yeah, well, it's a very good question. I, mean, I think, first of all, on the UK-France relationship, at the core of the defence relationship, I think that the cooperation will continue. I mean, almost, however bad things get in the wider political relationship. I'm thinking of, of what we agreed at the Lancaster House uh, Agreement, where we set up um, a shared nuclear weapon virtual testing facility in France with a 50-year treaty, which allows, which enables Britain to take its warheads in secure ways to Burgundy to test them on a very expensive piece of uh, scientific kit uh, in a virtual way and then bring them home again. The, that sort of relationship, the defense operational relationship, the armed forces cooperation, we now have a combined joint expeditionary force together. 
um, the work between the armed forces, that will continue. Um, but defense industrial cooperation, which was such a, a prominent part of the Lancaster House Agreement, uh, those high ambitions have largely come to nothing, not completely. Uh, we still work together on missiles in particular, but hopes for doing a drone together, doing a future combat aircraft together, some of the naval cooperation we hope to have hasn't worked. Uh, and that, I think, is partly because of Brexit and the fact that a toxic relationship with the EU makes it really difficult to cooperate with France or Germany or others uh, in these areas like defence industrial. Um, so I do not think that that is going to change while the current uh, British cabinet are in place. I think they are so entrenched now uh, in an adversarial relationship towards European countries um, which occasionally is dialed down to do some foreign policy cooperation, but is largely talking past each other. I think we saw that um, at Carvis Bay, as I said. I think we saw it again, I'm afraid, when Angela Merkel was here at Chequers for her farewell visit. Uh, and again, the arguments about Northern Ireland Protocol uh, tended to dominate the uh, press conference. So I do think that we'll have to wait for a change of, uh, of regime, as it were, a change of generation. I mean, my own feeling, and I say it in the book, <clears throat> is that when 15 years from now, when a new group of politicians in the UK come to power, those who grew up with Erasmus, with EasyJet, with uh, being able to move or settle around Europe freely and without constraints, when they come to power, uh, whatever their political complexion, I think that the relationship will ease uh, with an EU which itself will be changing by then. But uh, yes, I don't see that it's going to change you know, for the next five or 10 years. We've got to wait out a generation of carry too much baggage for that to be possible. Mm. Peter, I, I said at the beginning that one of the things about your CV is you, you were there at so many of these things, and you were there at Lancaster House. You were you were responsible for drafting something, making something happen for Lancaster House. Mm. In the decade that's passed, you must be a bit disappointed that it didn't develop further than it has. Yes, I mean the planets happen to align very nicely, and that. I think you oft, often has to be the case for these sort of breakthroughs. Um, I saw it previously when uh, Blair and Chirac agreed their Sao Malo declaration in 1998, which effectively launched the whole European defence enterprise. Uh, in 2010, the planets aligned. Sarkozy and Cameron were both very interested in making some quite bold statements about um, Britain and France having the same interests in defence and security, in nuclear in particular. Um, Sarkozy you know, had been able to overcome the French taboos about NATO, um, David Cameron and, and his cabinet came into office, arrived wanting to show that um, they were modern uh, Europeans looking for new uh, cooperation between countries of similar size with armed forces, who in the end were the only two in Europe who could go and do um, first entry combat operations. And so we produced two bold treaties. Um, the first one, as I say, on nuclear, I think, will endure. The second one, in the end, fell victim to the political climate, which worsened from 2016 onwards. And I think only really the, the operational work between the armed forces now survives. I think it is disappointing. Uh, I mean, I now see France and Germany cooperating on a combat fighter aircraft, while Britain and Italy and Sweden um, cooperate on a combat aircraft. And so here we go again for the third time in three generations of combat aircraft, there will be um, two competing European models with a shrinking export market for any of them. Yeah. Uh, that feels to me like a disaster waiting to happen and is a result of the broader political, you know, the, the toxic mm. politics of the moment, I'm afraid. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go now to, um, it's an anonymous question, um, but it's worth it. It's somebody, somebody who describes themselves as a new FCDO doer. So some new official in the new foreign right, office right. anonymously is saying this, right? <laughs> so generally enjoyed the book very much, been recommending it to everyone. So that sounds good. Sounds as if you hit it with the, with the younger generation there, Peter. Um, what strikes me is that strategies are hard to drive forward when ministers are operating on a much shorter time frame. Obviously, that's something you say in the book. It's a fight to get those products in front of seniors, given how precious time is currently. So, do you think a bipartisan ministry for futurology could resolve some of the, these issues, i.e. all parties deciding on an overall national strategy, 
And do you have any top tips for making ministers excited about strategic thinking? <laughs> You've spent 40 really years trying to excite ministers with strategic yeah. ideas, I know. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. No, and whoever has written that is absolutely bang on. Uh, and clearly the same experience you know, is being lived through now. I mean, I'm afraid my answer is no. Um, I don't see any scope for bipartisanship in the current polarized state of things in British politics. In a way, the moment for a bipartisan uh, opening initiative was immediately after the referendum outcome, uh, where Theresa May inherited this. She'd just become prime minister. Um, there was a very, uh, there was a decision by the British people uh, on what they didn't want to do, uh, but there was no clarity at all on what they did want to replace the relationship with the EU with. That was surely the moment where uh, a prime minister could have said, right, stop the clocks. Um, we're not going to initiate the two-year process with the EU. We're going to have a royal commission on national strategy. We're going to bring all the party leaders together. We're going to consult the public and have a year-long consultation. Okay, where do we go now? We've heard what the British people said. Now we need to um, distill out of that um, a policy and a plan. And the EU can wait until we're ready to do that. That would have been a critical strategic moment if we'd done that. Uh, that opportunity was missed, and things have got far more polarized even since then. So I fear bipartisanship, wonderful though it would be, it really can only exist in the House of Lords. I mean, there we can come together and uh, we can have sensible debates about foreign policy, but uh, I don't think outside the Lords that is possible. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, uh, you know, our anonymous um, speaker is exactly right. I think in the end, only officials and academics and um, journalists and parliamentarians can uh, find the time to help a busy government enmeshed in the sort of tyranny of the immediate to think longer term. How can you do it? Well, we need powerful ideas. Uh, we need them to be clearly expressed in short papers. That's no good academic writing, you know, 30 page things in foreign affairs, they won't get read. Um, and we need to alert ministers to things that may come and punch them on the nose, you know, in a year or five years time, like a pandemic, for example. And perhaps the, the, the acute case now is, is the climate change issue, which, of course, everyone signs up to believing in. But are they really taking the strategic decisions now that are at a level with the risks that we're facing? So it's the age old problem. Um, uh, the integrated review, I thought, was a very serious, thoughtful effort to address you know, the range of problems, but I thought it crucially uh, weakened by not setting out any priorities uh, among them. Mm. Okay, um, a live question from uh, Madeline Moon, MP for Bridgend. Madeline. Hello, Peter. Love Hello, Madeline. It. Absolutely adored it. I'm intrigued about how you've seen the importance to Britain and NATO's defence policy of the rising importance of the Black Sea. How do you see it becoming in defense, political, energy supply and security, and of course, cable communication security in policy and presence term? Madeline, lovely to hear from you. And it's always worrying to be posed a question by a former chair of the Defense Select Committee. Um, I think you're right. I think the Black Sea is now a fulcrum of competition um, between Russia and the West, and with the additional complexity, of course, of Turkey, uh, which you know has a, its own rather distinctive position in NATO uh, and very much interests of its own. I think it's also a fulcrum for the sort of hybrid competition that is going on now, which is not open shooting warfare. Um, but is far from peaceful, settled coexistence either. Uh, and the HMS Defender incident um, a couple of weeks ago, I think, was a good example of that. It was, you know, a surprisingly assertive move from the UK. Uh, I think one that was entirely justified in terms of uh, asserting uh, freedom of passage under the law of the sea, but nonetheless, you know, taking more risk perhaps than, than we have seen British governments do recently with Russia. Uh, but sent a very clear signal. But there are all these other conflicting issues, as you say, um, crucial energy issues, um, pipeline issues, uh, no doubt internet cable issues. I mean, it's becoming a very contested space, um, which is not exactly in the NATO area, but is a bit like the North Atlantic. It's very much uh, around the NATO area and has to be a crucial concern for NATO. 
So I think along with China policy, it needs to be added to the NATO agenda as a crucial Article 4 issue, if you like, an area of um, need for real consultations among member states, if not an Article 5 issue in terms of collective security guarantee, but a very much coming issue. There are others like the High North as well. Um, it's getting to be quite a confused and, and, and risky area, the uh, Euro-Atlantic area. Mm. Let's just go back to Brexit. Um, Tim, Major General Tim Cross, who's a good friend of um, most people on the call, I guess, um, asks a, um, uh, wants me to read a, uh, a quite a challenging question. And he says, our relationship with the EU does, of course, also depend on their attitude to the UK. And it's difficult to see their perspective, especially that of France, as other than one that is aimed at primarily ensuring that no, no other EU member has the temerity to leave. <laughs> so, you know, are, is part of the problem that they're trying to punish the UK for opting out of the EU? Uh, I honestly don't think that was what was driving them. Um, indeed, I don't think they needed to do anything to deter anybody else from trying to leave. Uh, the spectacle of Britain floundering around uh, in the Article 50 process, I think, would have been enough to deter any Hungarian or other leader who might have been thinking about leaving. And even Marine Le Pen's National Front in France, which used to be in favour of leaving the EU, is not anymore. So I don't think it's punishment. I think it was an absolute determination that they were going to protect their single market and their other interests, and that they were not going to have a Britain that cherry-picked all the good things from our previous access to the single market, for example, and not accept the disciplines that go with it. And that will seem rigid to many in the UK, uh, very legalistic. But then the EU is a very legalistic organisation. It only survives and exists because you know, it's all law-based. And I think that was it. They were determined that the UK would not somehow cherry-pick um, valuable access to their single market, which would weaken um, the controls they have around the single market. But I think you're right, though, Tim, to say that there were ways that the French and others could have gone about a relationship with the UK in security and defence, for example. Um, they could have uh, treated the Galileo issue in a much more sensitive way. They could have uh, reached out more to welcome the UK back into some kind of relationship, uh, for example, in, in defence, uh, which they didn't do. And they've been pretty rigid in that area. Actually, I'm not sure London were up for a very close relationship either. So there are definitely faults on both sides. But it was inevitable, I think, that the EU would apply all the subtle pressures of Article 50, remembering it was um, drafted by one Sir John Kerr, um, to, um, you know, to make sure that they preserved their model and, and in the process demonstrated what a painful exercise it was for a country to leave. Mm. Peter, thank you. Um, we have to leave it there because we were out at uh, two o'clock um, and I have to apologise to all of those who um, put questions that we haven't had time to take. I know um, from the gallery that there have been quite a lot of them, so I apologise that we can't handle those, but I hope that at some time in the future we might be able to come back to those sorts of issues and questions that uh, may be troubling you. Um, and I have to thank uh, Peter Ricketts most sincerely for uh, offering us this session. Um, I think, as you've seen, Peter, a lot of people have, have got hold of the book and everyone who's, who's got it has got something, to, something very positive to say about it. Oh, and I have to say, I mean, it, it is written with all the, the charm and the understatement, the art that conceals the art, as I always think, the, the understatement of the true Mandarin. And yet, this is a really tough book. It is a really hard-edged, important book, which doesn't pull uh, any punches. Um, and so it may be a, a hard choice for you to write. It's a very easy choice for us at the Global Security Forum to feature it uh, in the last of, of our meetings. So that's what we have done. Thank you very much for your time. I hope and trust that the book has the uh, impact that it deserves to have. And uh, thank you all uh, for joining us on this uh, final session. We hope to see you all in the autumn uh, when uh, we'll have different sorts of, of issues to cover and possibly a different way of covering them. But for now, thank you all for your attention. Good day. Thank you very much indeed, Michael, and to everyone.